am here to tell you the tale of Dixmont State Hospital. Dixmont State Hospital was opened in 1864 during the last year of the Civil War. And it stayed open till 1984. It was once called Department of the Insane in the Western Pennsylvania Hospital of Pittsburgh. It had 37 buildings, two ballrooms, a morgue, and laundry chutes that connected each of the buildings underground. It stood open for 120 years, 120 years of happiness, 120 years of sadness, and 120 years of insanity. It was eventually demolished in 2006. It stayed abandoned for 15 years. And during those 15 years, those playgrounds, those underground laundry chutes, and that more became a playground for local teenagers and ghost hunters. One of the favorite activities if you were a teenager playing around or even a ghost hunter would be to go into the morgue to open one of the drawers and to sit in and have someone close the door and sit on those big slab trays and see if you could hear anything around you. Sometimes you would hear pounding, sometimes you would hear a whisper in your ear, or maybe something would whisper your name. But about 10 years into this being a playground, the ghost hunters and the teenagers started to notice something. They started to notice a man guarding the morgue to make sure they didn't go in. And when they went up to this man or they would hide from this man, they noticed he would slowly disappear as if to preserve the memory of all those that died there, saying, this is not a playground. This is not a place to ghost hunt. This is our sanctuary. The books that move themselves. Every night, all the librarians make sure all, all the books are properly shelved. The next morning, they will come in and the books are all scattered all over the floor. It's always the mystery books. The librarians try to outsmart the spirit by moving the books to another area but always the books end up on the floor. I now present to you the tale of the painter and the priest. For my story, I've actually come to the scene of the haunting itself. St. Nicholas Catholic Church here in Milvaire, site of the world-famous Max Ovanka murals. Those murals happen to be the heart of our story itself. In 1937, Max Ovanka was hired to paint the murals in this church. He asked but one thing, he be left alone from sundown to sunup while he paints his murals. The priest quickly agrees to this. The ghost of St. Nicholas is not. Four nights go by, four nights of peaceful painting. On the fifth night, Max Ovanka notices a figure start to work his way up the aisle, going towards the center, the altar that you can see right there. He doesn't say anything. He thinks it's the priest just doing a nightly ritual. Then he, as the man walks down the aisle, he gets to the final set of doors and vanishes into thin air. Every dog in Millville barks in unison. So unusual that Max Ovanka noted it in his diaries. He's freaked out, but doesn't want to give up the lucrative task he's been assigned to cover the church and murals, so he continues to paint. A few more nights pass. Four more nights, four nights of painting. On the fifth night this time, he notices that the church gets colder as the figure walks up and down the aisle. He's had enough, so he rushes to the rectory, which you can see right there, where the school is. And he demands to know why the priest has been interrupting him as he paints. The priest denies having left the rectory all night, either night. However, 
he does finally confess that the parishioners of this church believe it to be haunted and have seen over the last 15 years the ghost of a priest. He puts no stock in those stories himself. But he does, on request of Vanka, come with him the next night as he goes to paint the murals one more time. The priest walks in joking about the haunting, saying it's ridiculous that there are no such things as spirits. And suddenly in the back of the church, thumping, a thumping. He goes back to investigate, a little freaked out and concerned himself this time. He performs a makeshift ritual, sort of a pseudo exorcism, screaming Bible verses at the wall. And while he's concentrated on chasing the thumping off, Vanka sees in the fourth row, a man with a cubist painting style face appear. He doesn't know what to make of this, but before he can call the attention of the priest to the man, the man disappears into thin air. Both Vanka and the priest leave. Neither one of them wants to be in the church anymore. The priest goes back to his rectory, and as he tries to sleep, there's a thump, a thump, and a thump above his bed. He can't sleep. He decides to go with Vanka the next night, fearing for the painter's safety, but also fearing for his own sanity. Safety in numbers, he thinks. Well, as Vanka works the next night, the candles on the altar start to melt. Not unusual for a candle, but quite unusual for an unlit candle. The priest and Vanka leave again, just a half night's work complete. At this point, the priest decides to call on other local priests and clergymen to come assist, performing a more thorough ritual and exorcism to get the ghost out. Vanka refuses to go in the church while this happens but stands right outside where we are now and can clearly see the altar. On the altar at this point, there is a candle designed to simplify the Holy Spirit, the candle of the eternal flame in a windproof glass box, perfectly designed to let the candle burn without ever going out. During the exorcism, it goes out. They relight it, it goes out again. And at this point, Vanka knows he's done. He completes the murals he's painting above the altar. But before he can leave, he's cornered by the press because you can't call the clergyman in Pittsburgh to a ghost and not have the press notice. Not only does the Pittsburgh press run it on the front page, it's during the war in Europe. So it has to be quite newsworthy to get this sort of acclaim. Picking up the posts, the Pittsburgh press story, Harper's Bazaar sends out a magazine at author who writes a 10 page essay on this haunting. Max Ivanka leaves, but not never to return. For he signed his contract and he knows that he needs to paint the rest of the murals. He comes back and completes the murals. And any proof you actually need that this haunting has changed the man lies in those murals. All you have to do is look at the murals and paint them first. The peaceful, idyllic scenes over the altar. And look at the murals he painted upon his return. The horrors of war, gas mask Mary, some of the most grotesque and horrifying religious imagery in the United States, if not the world. And see that he was a changed man. So if you want to come to the site of a true Pittsburgh haunting, it's right here in Millville. Max Ovanka's murals, the painter, and the priest. The Workman That Never Left A staff person in the basement saw a man standing next to the electrical box. As, as the library staff went to approach the man, he suddenly disappeared. The staff person asked his supervisor why someone was in the basement, which is off limits to patrons. The supervisor told him in a whispered voice. It was the workman who had been electrocuted while installing the electrical box the day the Carnegie Library got electricity. Girl.
Hertz has been a haunted house staple of Pittsburgh for years and years. And the previous location was in Etna, PA, just about 10 minutes from downtown Pittsburgh. It was located in an over 100-year-old historic and haunted building. It was home to Etna Elks, Order Number 932. It, was, it also used to be the home of many miners in the early 1900s. I've been attending Scare House since I was about 11 years old, and I've worked there for several uh, years now in different positions, uh, including a scare actor, a scenic builder, and in the summer of 2018, I was the marketing and communication intern. Scare House has a fairly small crew throughout the summer, mostly people doing marketing and you know, building endeavors, stuff like that. Because of this, the large building remained mostly empty, other than five or so employees and the horrifying monsters creeping around every corner. I worked there for about a year at this time, and I was used to the creepy things that I would see on a daily basis. A murderous clown, typical Tuesday for me. For years I'd heard that the building was haunted. To me it felt like lore, it was just to scare the customers coming in. But, one dark August day, that all changed. About a week prior to that day, I had lost my, my wristband. It was similar to a Live Strong wristband. Couldn't find it anywhere. And then, my manager told me to go move some stuff down in uh, the, the basement area. It's uh, another one of their haunted attractions. So I was walking around, and walked down the steps, and then down to the other side of the basement. And I looked down and I saw my, my bracelet just laying on the ground right there. And funny thing is, I hadn't been down over there for over a year at that point. The last time I was down there was when I was working down there as a scare actor. So I thought, that's odd. Maybe it just got kicked around or something. I leaned over to pick it up, and as I did, I received a phone call. There was no caller ID. I answered. All I could hear was heavy breathing. Just... <sighs> over and over again. So I hung up, and I ran upstairs just about as fast as I could. I was a little nervous, a little afraid. But me, the skeptic, just thought, eh, it's nothing. It was just a coincidence. But I was still nervous to go work down there the rest of the day. So I did some small tasks, just building this and that upstairs for a while. And my manager said, we need more stuff moved down there. And I said, I'm kind of scared, got to be honest. Can you come work down there with me? She said, sure. In the basement, there's two separate storage places that are all along the outside of the path that people follow. I was on the left side. She was on the right side, just moving, organizing stuff. There was a weird, weird feeling in the air. Something I couldn't quite understand, honestly. I was moving stuff on the one side, and I heard her walking around the other side, pushing around boxes. But something just didn't feel right about it. I wasn't sure what it was. After about five or ten minutes of that happening, I yelled and I said, Hey, Nicole. No response. I did it again. Hey, Nicole. No response. I thought, that's weird. So I started walking over there, and all of a sudden, I hear a gigantic crash and then silence I start to walk over to inspect what happened and I look to my right where the staircase is and there's Nicole walking downstairs she could see that I was pale as a ghost at this point and I said Nicole how long have you been upstairs she said about 15 minutes does that make it better or worse? And I said, that's, that's far worse. It means the entire time I was down there completely alone and something else was moving things around down there. And 
this point, I started to believe that maybe this place was a little bit haunted. From then on, I continually experienced things on a nearly daily basis. One time I went down there before I was going to be working that night and scaring people, and I tried to take a nap. I was tired. And the ghosts wouldn't stop opening and closing, opening and closing the doors. I kept yelling, hey, is anyone there? No response. Finally, I just yelled, please leave me alone. I'm tired. And it went silent. The moral of the story is, maybe you should just befriend the ghosts that are trying to scare you. The judge was here. A local city judge frequented the library after it opened in 1895. He was a regular visitor often seen among the stacks. One day in the early 1900s, for reasons unknown, he hung himself in the stacks. His body was found and removed. Then the staff reported seeing mysterious writing appear, but the writing wasn't at the level any human hand could reach. It was high up on the ceiling near the spot of the hanging noose. The writing is always the same, Santitio est hit, Latin for the judges. I'm going to tell you the tale of Blue Mist Road. Now, some people don't know what Blue Mist Road is, that's where I grew up, is up in the North Hills of Pittsburgh, in North Park. It's called Irwin Road. Nobody really calls it Irwin Road anymore. They call it Blue Mist Road. And let me tell you why. A couple years ago, a couple decades ago actually, there were a lot of murders and horrific lynchings that happened in North Park on Irwin Road specifically. And they called it Blue Mist Road. So during all these times, and if you believe this sort of stuff, victim spirits will still neander down the road. And if you're absolutely certain that you want to experience this, we did this as a prank, unfortunately, when I was in high school. Me and a couple buddies, we took a trip up to Blue Mist Road, and we we wanted to see if everything was true. You know, sometimes people say things and it's just not real, but we parked on Blue Mist Road. And if you really, really want to try, stop, you put your car in park, and you honk the horn three times three times and when that happens those three honks they say summon the spirits and they still will roam you'll see strange orbs floating around the car you'll even have heard tale of an angry disgusting morbid looking dog human hybrid There have been tales here on Blue Mist Road, too, that a mother and her children were brutally murdered by the Ku Klux Klan in their home along Blue Mist Road and then buried in a septic tank by the husband and the father. And they wander down the street when the sun goes down. And they say it's called Blue Mist Road because when you honk three times, that's when this mysterious paranormal blue mist gulfs around the road as far as you can see forwards and backwards and that's how you know that the paranormal is about to start now there are some that believe that there's some good paranormal stuff that happens with this like you might see a husband and his wife dancing in the moonlight but there's one catch have to visit during a full moon and that's you know 
when everything starts going wild. So that's the tale of Blue Mist Road in North Park at Pittsburgh. Thank you so much for joining us for these ghost stories today. And if you feel like supporting local artists and local work in the Pittsburgh area, please feel free to donate to Pittsburgh Bridge 